Good morning, everybody. It's uh, it's really a pleasure to be with you all. Um, like Patrick, thank you for the for the good introduction. Um, this event was scheduled to be happening much earlier uh, in this calendar year, uh, but I'm glad we have the opportunity now to speak to you digitally. Uh, so my name is Michel Engetja. I'm the Marketing and Operations Director for Microsoft Netherlands. And prior to this role, I was responsible for the Azure uh, business in Western Europe uh, for the last six years. So that was a kind of a roller coaster and, and a lot of experience in, in trying to build a cloud business for Microsoft uh, in Western Europe. Uh, and today's topic is around new technologies uh, that are requiring new skills. Uh, and this is a session that I'm doing together with Jeffrey. Uh, and Jeffrey, maybe you can introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Michel. So my name is Jeffrey Vermeulen and indeed I am uh, the business group lead for Microsoft Azure here in the Netherlands. So uh, well, what Michel was already referring to, he's been building the Azure business from a Western European perspective. And we, together with you and our partners, are trying to build it uh, to, at, at the same magnitude here in the Netherlands. And I just realized that in some shape or form, we've been working together for uh, the past 12 years or so. But we've never done a virtual gig before. We've so, never uh, done a virtual is, gig. Uh, this, is, this is a first <laughs> for both of us, I think. Uh, it is. It is. So you know, again, this is uh, it's time for new. It's time for innovation for ourselves as well. Uh, the topics we want to discuss today, uh, and Patrick already alluded to it, to it. So we want to talk about digital transformation. Give you some very concrete examples of customers that went through digital transformation and the value that they got out of this transformation. And we want to talk obviously about skills, the skills gap, and you know what's what does it take? What does it require? to upskill your organization. And we're also going to zoom into the definition of tech intensity. I think that's uh, worthwhile to mention. And then uh, maybe to add to the agenda, right? We're also gonna show some customer examples, show some evidence, and also uh, share some best practices for you to start building your own skilling plan. I think, did I miss anything? No, this is, this is, these are the main topics. And I think these are all, I think, good ingredients also for the rest of the calendar that Patrick shared and the topics that will be addressed later on, uh, later on in the session. So I suggest we dive straight in. Yes, let's, let's go. Um, you know, first, let's talk a bit about digital transformation. The digital transformation is definitely a reality at the moment. And obviously, you know about the digital transformation. These are figures from uh, the World Economic Forum and for, that are actually predicting that the value out of the digital transformation for commercial companies, for society, is over $100 trillion of new value being created. Uh, and clearly, that's only possible when you start investing in technology. It's the technology that's enabling this. It's cloud technology, it is AI, these are sensor technologies, all the latest technology that are unlocking new value for a lot of organizations. So that's the opportunity side, I would say, of digital transformation, but clearly, there's the other side of transformation, and that's a risk profile. Uh, and the data also shows, historically, if you look at, just take the, uh, you know, the Fortune 500 companies, over half of these companies, Jeffrey, that existed in 2000, don't exist anymore. They're gone. Right, they're gone. They're out of the, the Fortune 500. They fail to transform in a meaning, meaningful way to still exist. And the prediction is that, you know, out of this list in 10 to 15 years from now, companies will definitely disappear or become less relevant. So, in, so maintaining your relevancy through transformation is, is really essential. And I think, um, you know, I, I like the opportunity. I don't even know how many zeros 100 trillion is, but that's probably <laughs> a lot, right? And then I think on the, on, the, on the second piece that you just covered, right, the threat of digital transformation, the risk that it imposes to existing businesses, I think those risks will only be accelerated by the current crisis that we're facing, right? Uh, how many bankruptcies have we seen over the course of the past month? Um, what is it, the airliners getting, uh, getting, going, going bankrupt? Uh, retailers, of course, being in, uh, in, in dangerous places right now, since a lot of people have turned to, uh, to e-tail e experiences instead of their usual uh, brick and mortar shopping experiences. I think health providers are also under huge pressure. So I love the, the statistics on the Fortune 500, but I also believe that we're seeing this uh, acceleration of, uh, of, of companies uh, that are exposed to risk uh, all around us, right? In the, Clearly. In the world here in the Netherlands. So. Oh, absolutely. And I, you could arguably say that COVID-19 
even though it's the worst pa and pandemic that we have all experienced, has been sort of a catalyst for acceleration of the transformation. And obviously it started from working from home, but it's also education from home and all the e-commerce uh, companies that are now benefiting from having a digital platform to be able to transact and do business on. So if you just dive one step deeper, right, if you look at this trend of transformation, what's really the driver behind this, what we're seeing is that the need to differentiate yourself in your services, in your products. You have, you know, you've seen so many examples of that where the business is really requiring a new innovation. Uh, and you, you see this in these figures, like 40 to 60% of IT spend is happening outside of IT. It's happening inside the business. The business is demanding a lot more increase in, 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 in agility, in innovation from the IT organization. Uh, and IT, frankly, uh, all the customers that we've spoken to, they have a hard time keeping up with that demand. And you see that it reflects on you know, your revenue stream, but it also requires a different culture in your organization to be able to adopt that. So this digital culture uh, where, you, where you have really a customer-centric experience, you really put sort of the new value that you want to create central, breaking through silos in your organization is a requirement to be able to make sure that you transform. Yeah, I love the first statistic, right? What you're saying, like, the majority of IT spend is actually outside of IT. And from, a, I would say traditionally from a Microsoft perspective, we are used to talking to IT managers, CIOs most of all, right? But it's basically the, what is it? Marketing departments, it the HR departments, the finance departments who are currently holding the majority of their IT budget. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a different ball game these days. So. It's very different and they have a need to innovate. They need to innovate fast, they want to differentiate their services, uh, but that requires skills. Uh, let's clearly say, I mean, you need to have the skills to be able to develop these services. But also what you clearly see is that in order to transform, if you look across the board from these companies, they take their data estate as a very core essential piece to the transformation. If you look across all the cases that we've seen, all the customers that we've talked to, uh, and then apply that data estate and do the analysis on that, make sure it, it drives your innovation. Uh, you know, AI is not incubation anymore. It's becoming really much mainstream. You know, the figures are now showing that even half of the applications do have an AI component, either cognitive services or predictive services in one shape or another in, included in the application. And it is so essential to embrace the value of your data estate uh, to be able to make that transformation in, uh, in digital transformation. Question is, do you have the right skills to do you uh, have the right skills? technology, right? Do you have the right skills? I think that's that's really uh, the essential question here. So lots of, I would say, insightful data points in terms of looking at, uh, looking at the transformation itself. Now, as Microsoft, we have a mission to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. This is our mission statement uh, from the company. Uh, and this mission statement came about you know, roughly when Sacha became our new CEO. Uh, and Sacha uh, was our new CEO in 2014. Uh, he was only our third CEO uh, in the company's existence, in, uh, in 40 years of existence, only the third CEO. Now, when he became CEO, the company was actually in a very financially healthy state. But there was a problem. And the problem that we had as a company is that we were clearly slowly becoming less relevant from a technology and impact perspective. So Sacha took that moment and reflected with his leadership team on, you know, what is the value of Microsoft? What is the value that we can provide to the society, to customers, to organizations? And that brought us back to the core uh, of who we are, which is a platform company uh, and a technology company. And that resulted in this mission statement. So, if, you know, in hindsight, this is a story about Microsoft, but we were going, undergoing our own transformation. Uh, and I think we were, st we were still on that path, even though we're now approaching our first decade of cloud technology, we're still sort of halfway that transformation ourselves to make sure that we stay relevant uh, for you uh, as, an, as an organization and for partners uh, alike. Yeah, I love the mission statement. I think even after six years, it's still incredibly relevant, right? Then uh, I would say you know, we're still in the middle of that transformation. We, we are constantly transforming um, our company. Uh, we are, we absolutely are. I think transformation will be a constant um, and it applies to us, it will apply to your organization as well. But redefining that mission, uh, understanding what your core values are and understanding where that longer term uh, vision is gonna lead you 
will be important. So it's not only about the, the bits and the bytes and the technology, but certainly also about the culture that you're setting. And we'll talk a little bit more about culture uh, today and in the other sessions as well. Yeah, I think Eveline is up next, right? The, right after our presentation, and she will dive deeper on uh, on the cultural aspects of, uh, of change. So that's going to be will. an interesting uh, story for sure. Um, let's talk about tech intensity. Let's talk uh, about tech intensity. Okay. So tech intensity, and I'll forward a slide here to you. Thanks. Um, so tech intensity, I, I promise to zoom in on the definition of tech intensity. And I think uh, Nasatya Nadella has written about this in uh, one of his uh, prior blog posts as well, right? Uh, tech, tech intensity is much more than customers just adopting the technology that we bring to market, but it's basically customers embracing the technology is what he writes in order to basically transform themselves. And I love this slide, I always like to bring it because it shows some uh, some Dutch examples, but also, also a couple of international ones that we will uh, point out later on in this uh, slide deck, that we talk about later on in this slide deck. Uh, um, examples of customers who have transformed themselves, right? Uh, and I just wanted to uh, elaborate on two of the examples that we see here on this slide. I think, first of all, BOM, the Netherlands. Uh, it's in a really interesting case because BOM, the Netherlands, is uh, responsible for the maintenance of our, what they call concrete asphalt or asphalt concrete roads in the Netherlands, right? And uh, of course, as you can imagine, if, uh, if any damage occurs to the concrete asphalt, asphalt roads that we drive on every day, that imposes uh, huge risks to the people using those roads, to motorcyclists, to cars, to trucks maybe. And uh, yeah, you, you, you don't want to imagine what could happen if, uh, I don't know, somehow you will uh, ri drive into such a pothole as, they, as they, they're referring to it. And uh, I don't know, uh, and, 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 and crash or whatever other type of damage might occur. So their main job actually is just to maintain those concrete asphalt roads and to do that in an efficient way um, to repair any damages as quickly as possible and prevent any accidents from uh, from occurring. So they used to do the uh, inspection uh, pretty manually actually, but uh, a couple of years ago they turned to Microsoft and they turned to um, a, a partner of ours, in this case uh, Orange Next, and they said, hey, can't we just use Microsoft Azure technology or Microsoft technology in general and do this in a much more efficient way? Um, so what they've done, they have uh, basically equipped um, cars with 360 degrees uh, cameras I think uh, you might all have seen such mm -hmm. cars driving uh, driving around in your streets uh, before. Uh, that's when you get the parking fines, right? That's uh, when we get the parking but, fines. But um, they've equipped uh, cars with those 360 degrees cameras, and they're basically uploading all the, that footage to the Microsoft Azure platform, then analyzing, crunching that data based on uh, AI technology, the technology mm -hmm. that you were already referring to. Um, and also some smart algorithms that they have developed. And now they are basically able to, to inspect those roads much more effectively than they used to when they were still doing this as a manual process and also uh, act much faster when any damages occur. And I like this example because it's a nice example of tech intensity in a sense that, um, of course, they're using that technology that they have developed to basically optimize their own processes, but they're also thinking about, hey, how can we use the technology that we have developed to invent new business models? So can we resell the solution to other companies, to other countries perhaps? But also think of this in terms of, hey, can we use this technology and inspect something other than asphalt concrete roads? I don't know, signposting next to the streets, uh, trees maybe, but also, hey, can we use the same technology to inspect the railroads that we use on a, lots on a of daily basis? Lots of innovation capabilities. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing, really. And I think uh, talking about railroads, right, that, that's, that's a really nice segue to the second case that I wanted to talk to you about very briefly, and uh, that's the example of uh, NS or the Dutch uh, railroads. They have turned to Microsoft a couple of years ago and said, hey, we want to make the journeys of our passengers much more comfortable, right? A lot of customers or a lot of passengers are complaining because they can't find a, find a proper seat in, uh, in, in, in traffic hours, in high peak hours. Uh, so what they've done together with Microsoft, they have developed what they call a seat finder app. And 
really relevant in these COVID times, right? Yeah. Because it is. now we're kind of obliged to. There are less to seats keep on the on the trains. So exactly, you, you and we, we got to keep the distance, right, in order from the the for the for the virus to spread. So basically, they developed that app. I think it's integrated in the in the NS app that mm. you might all use, and it's basically using a lot of data sources. The apps that we use ourselves, mm -hmm. the train load distribution information coming in from the trains, car, from the train cars themselves, um, but also uh, a lot of online media. And they're basically gathering all that information on the Azure platform, then crunching it, and then giving you as a passenger advice on where to stand on the platform in order to maximize basically seat occupancy yeah. in those train cars that we're Great example. About, uh, so I think that's a, that's a really, really interesting example of how a company like NS, but I right. also talked about BOM, is using our technology to drive efficiency. These are very powerful examples. I think, you know, tech intensity, I like this term that Sacha kind of put on it because it's, it is really about your capability and your ability to adopt new technology, right? New technology, how fast are you able to apply it? And actually, it, what it says is that you are turning yourself into a software company. Now, I've worked in software companies all my life. Uh, and so I can tell you when you transform into a software company, clearly you need to have a roadmap. You need to have a vision. You need to be able to attract the right talent to your organization. And talent is scarce, as you all know, uh, especially when it comes to great architects and great developers. And you have to keep the pace. So you have to understand what those new technologies are. And think a little bit more as a software company, even though that might not be your core business. And that's what Sacha talks about, right? You want to be tech intense, you need to be able to be on top of the latest technology as well. So, hey, and I like the um, I, I like to elaborate on the on the concepts of intelligent edge and intelligent cloud a little bit deeper, right? Coming back to the examples that I just shared, the examples of NS and the examples of uh, BOM in the Netherlands, right? NS. The Dutch railroads are basically using a lot of different uh, data sources in their, what we often refer to it, in their intelligent edge. Uh, and they are using our intelligent cloud te technology to analyze and crunch all the data that they receive mm -hmm. and make recommendations to their passengers, right? Or, or in the case of BUM, basically um, uh, optimize the effectiveness of their uh, asphalt inspection. So uh, I love how they employ our technology to drive uh, efficiencies. And I think we already mentioned the, the term Microsoft Azure a couple of times before. We're also going to talk about Microsoft Azure in a bit more detail later on in this deck. But I think it's good to point out the fact that uh, Microsoft Azure is not the only cloud that we as Microsoft serve. Um, we've got Microsoft 365. Um, most of you probably know it already. It's the basically uh, the co composition of Office 365, of uh, EMS, of uh, Windows, of course, uh, the products that we all yeah. use and love. Um, it's got Microsoft Teams as well. Well, have we seen a big uptake of Teams use over the past Massive. weeks, right? Of course, sp spurred by the current pandemic, but uh, well, it's been uh, busy months of. Uh, Say, I'd say especially February, March time it frame, has. when a lot of customers were turning to us and asking us, well, right, how fast can we deploy those uh, Teams environments in order to enable those remote working scenarios? Yeah. Like, uh, of course, to go out Dynamic, uh, Dynamics 365 and our Power Platform. For the people, our platform is pretty recent addition to our, our, our cloud um, uh, portfolio, so to say, it's got Power Apps, it's Power, got apps, Power, BI, Power BI, it's got Power Automate, um, a lot of new new technologies that we're bringing to market there. And of course, last but not least, let's talk about Microsoft Azure. Let's in talk a bit about Azure. Detail, right? So for those of you who don't know Microsoft Azure yet, um, Microsoft Azure is our cloud platform that lets you um, develop, host, and manage um, cloud applications, right? It's uh, more than just the um, basic compute storage and networking te technology that you are used to consume from your own data centers, but it adds uh, additional capabilities to the platform. I think we've already referred to a couple of them in the examples that we just shared and, and in your earlier introduction, right? But I really like to call out some of the capabilities that we, uh, that we put on top of that, what is it? basic infrastructure layer on the on, on the bottom side of mm -hmm. this uh, slide, mm -hmm. 
where we talk about the web and mobile applications, where we talk about data warehousing, where we talk about the artificial intelligence and machine learning, of course. And, uh, and, and we've also talked about a couple of uh, IoT or Internet exactly. of Things examples. Uh, and of course, right, uh, except, for, uh, except for those additional capabilities, there's also these edge devices that we like to talk about. Uh, Azure Data Box, your way of transferring, transferring massive amounts of data to the Azure Cloud. Right Azure right. Sphere, right, the yeah. Swiss Azure Sphere OS that we've introduced for your, really for your chipsets. And uh, I think we've also got a HoloLens example later. We do have a HoloLens example later. Now these, these top line edge devices, clearly there's over 30 billion devices connected to the internet. And these devices, I mean, if they are, they are standalone devices, but they consume a lot of data. They, they are becoming more smart. They can sense their environments. They can ingest data. So you want to put AI and intelligence on the edge, exactly. right? So how do you make sure that the data interfaces with your cloud? How do you make these devices more smart? So you see that top line of, of you know, edge devices are becoming much, uh, much more integrated and an extension of Azure that you run on the cloud. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's a. Uh, I love the the width of our portfolio, right? I think uh, it it always always depends on how you count. I think we're currently distinguishing two hundred plus different different uh, services, and yeah. I love how we're constantly adding new capabilities uh, to the platform. You already talked about the uh, the, the skills that uh, that people require in this new cloud era, and I love to also address this slide uh, just for a minute or two and talk about the top five technologies that organizations are using mm -hmm. to achieve that tech intensity, right? Yeah. To embrace our, our cloud world, our cloud technology and transform their business models. Um, some capabilities that you might not have in-house already, but you might want to invest in, in order to, what is it, digitally prepare yourself. Think about um, okay, what is it skills for machine learning. Mm -hmm. um, think about uh, Internet of Things. AI is what we just uh, discussed when we were talking about um, about BAM, for example. But we've also got a couple of examples that we're going to show later yeah. on. Blockchain and mixed, rea mixed reality are also two um, very important technologies that customers are currently investing in to basically achieve their own tech intensity. Yeah, they are. So let's have a look at a couple of examples, Jeff, because yeah. we've been talking a lot about theory. Ah. Let's, let's, let's look at some very concrete examples. Let's, let's talk about two. Let's, let's start talk with about the two first. examples. So, so and, 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 and we brought two videos, right? So it's not a complete surprise <laughs> to us, but uh, we've, talked about, we've brought two, two, two videos. And I uh, first like to start off with a, with a short video for, uh, from, from Ahold. Okay. Um, I wonder, do you ever do grocery shopping at Albert Heijn? I do uh, grocery Michelle? shopping at uh, uh, Albert Heijn, yes, in the Netherlands, and, and, for sure. And maybe a quick question to you. Do you think that an algorithm can bake a cake? An algorithm can bake a cake. I, I would not be surprised if it did. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to roll a quick video and show you how it does. Can an algorithm help you bake a cake? For customers of Dutch grocery retailer Albert Heijn, the answer is yes. The company is harnessing Microsoft technology to create rich, hyper-personalized shopping experiences. We are for a long time already filling grocery stores, delivering groceries to the customer. So we have a lot of knowledge and a lot of data available. By going to the cloud, we unlock the new opportunities to actually make value of our data. We have uh, 10 million customers every week and they shop at Albert Heijn online 24-7, so we really need a uh, solution that can serve our customers anywhere, anytime. An example is Predict My List, um, because we know what you buy online and we know what you buy offline, we can make a prediction for you what you will probably need next time in your shopping basket. And this way we can really offer you a very easy shopping experience from end to end. We are currently testing in four stores a concept called tap to go and basically the summary is that with a card or your phone, you walk into the store, tap the shelf, grab your product uh, and just go. So basically we reduce the shopping journey from three, four minutes to 20 seconds. The next step I think is a very nice one because with all the data we gather from people tapping the shelf, 
we can start helping them much better. Our dream is to add hyper-personalization, so real-time offers based on your contextual situation at that moment. And you can imagine many, many use cases we can implement to make people more happy to have a better life in the morning, in the afternoon and in the evening. We were looking for an open platform that could enable us quickly with new technology and the emerging technologies. Also that we could adopt and service in open source tools like, uh, for example, uh, VMs on Linux uh, next to Windows. And that is why we chose for Microsoft Azure. So what we started here has now also been adopted in the wider Ahol Del Heze group. And that makes it possible to share algorithms over the globe and to make each other better by adopting and implementing this data analytical platform in the cloud. I think we made a giant leap. So we are now really ready for the future. And I always love this example, right, Ben? I think you are right. An algorithm can it's possible. Help, it's possible. help you bake a cake. Uh, and that's uh, so recognizable, right? That you walk to the Albert Heijn to do your shopping and suddenly you have your personalized, what is it, advertisements in your pockets and you're wondering, like, how do they know that I... It is, uh, again. That, that, that is the product that I want to buy uh, today, right? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's again a good example, I would say, of a company that's really using a data as their core asset. Yeah. And how can you leverage that data to transform your business and create differentiated services? And like many uh, organizations, maybe perhaps in your business as well, you have data warehouses. Are you able to unlock that data in a fast and efficient way and get it into the hands of your data scientist in that sense and make sure that they can uh, innovate fast on that? Uh, are we ready to move to the second example? Yeah, I think I asked you to bring another example. Yeah, right, of I a, did. Of a, of a case that, that you particularly like. Uh. Yeah, I like this example. And this is an example more in the sense of mixed reality. Uh, you know, when, and this is an example of you know, when you purchase a car. Uh, you know, it's not an occasion that you do very often, but when you purchase a car, right? How, how good are you in envisioning the technology uh, and how the color and how the, you know, how the real technology works? before you send off the order to the manufacturer to produce it, right? I mean, it's, you, you, you guess, you make a wild yeah. guess of how that's gonna look I like, want right? that color, those features. Exactly. And a letter or something, but what is gonna roll off the conveyor belt, you never really know. You, you right? never really know. And in that sense, the manufacturer, they put so much innovation into the car, but they're not able to show these examples. So here's an example of a company, uh, Volvo in this case, and they really used uh, mixed reality in a sense, using HoloLens to uncover new PKB capabilities that how you could you know, envision car selling in the, into the future. Volvo is really a human-centric company. That's the core focus of everything we've done in terms of the products we develop, but also the way we interact with their customers. All people know that we stand for safety, but Volvo is so much more. HoloLens helps us to push the envelope on innovation for our customers. The HoloLens is a device that you put on your head and it doesn't intrude in any of the things you do, but it also extends the realities around you. You can do something you could never do before. You can see the soul of the car. You can strip the body out and stay with the skeleton and you, you can play around with it. The HoloLens can allow our customers to see features, colors, options. So rather than working on the computer, seeing things, you can be part of the experience. No one understands how car sensors actually works today. Through the HoloLens, you can see how the car perceives you. And then you, know, you give me as a human being the vantage point of a sensor helps to build a much better trust in this type of systems. For example, you see a car coming in front of you. The car has features that could aid in that situation. We have a lot of features that we don't necessarily want you to experience it all, but it's part of our proposition. You're buying into the safest car brand in the world. One of the great things that was said to us by Volvo when we started this was that uh, Volvo loves technology but only if it makes people's lives simpler. Microsoft HoloLens lets people take imagination and make it real much more efficiently and in a much more collaborative manner. HoloLens will not only help us in the car buying process at the dealership, 
it can evolve into many areas. We think there are many alternative applications of this tool in the future, and Volvo clearly has an aspiration to, to break out of the pack. It's, um, it's cool. It's, it's way cool. Uh, using these HoloLenses uh, in their showrooms and allowing customers to, uh, you know, potential customers to, to envision how the car will look like. Uh, and that started obviously out as a, as a, as a cool innovation of, uh, and a cool project. But by its sense, uh, you see HoloLens being used in more and more scenarios. I mean, you see airplane manufacturers using HoloLens for, you know, designing of airplanes. We have examples of truck maintenance being done with HoloLenses. Uh, and there are many more examples. So this is just an emerging technology. But again, it relies on data and understanding what you do with your data estate and developing new applications. And we already talked about those five yeah. new technologies that people should invest in, right? The, with uh, mixed reality being one of them. I love the other lens examples. And, and again, apologies for the, for for the, the, audio. For the audio, right? Uh, but uh, really encourage you to find the, the cases. I think they're online and everywhere. And they otherwise, are. we will just send over the, uh, the examples to you. So let's talk, let's bridge this into, I mean, tech intensity. Well, we talked about it, we've given you a lot of uh, examples. So it does require new skills, right? It's not something that your traditional IT or department would be natural to, to understand. You really have to invest in new skilling. Uh, and Jeffrey, so what are these what are these new skills that are required? How would you talk about? Yeah, this? And this is a this is a long list of of, of job roles, so to say. But it, and and I like it because it's uh, it's pretty comprehensive and it just shows how things are evolving from the I'd say the old world to the new world, right? And we've seen uh, we've seen similar changes occur in the past. So this is not new and very specific to the cloud era. Basically, technology is evolving, and the and 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 we as as, as an organization, as companies, need to make parallel investment in skills. We've seen uh, with the introduction of virtualization, we've seen people who were, were very knowledgeable about, uh, what is it, hardware engineering and hardware maintenance who had also to, who also had to acquire new skills in order to work in that virtualized world, as we called it back then. And, uh, and now we see job roles uh, evolving maybe e even faster than we did see before, mm -hmm. right? From uh, on the left side of, uh, of this picture where we have, uh, what is it, uh, uh, job roles that we were referring to, like the, the ones of a developer suddenly evolving to a engineering and DevOps role in the cloud era. And uh, also I'd like to point out uh, other examples like the ones of uh, people being a network data center engineer and how, what type of, what is it, uh, um, skills are you going to acquire that are suitable in that uh, new yeah. cloud world? Yeah, and it's important to point out these are uh, not you know, randomly chosen examples. These examples are actually referring to also how we transferred ourselves in our IT department within Microsoft. So we listed the specific job roles and then we did a mapping of the future roles and tried to understand what those capabilities would look like. And then intentionally moving these roles into the new framework, uh, into the new cloud era in that sense. So that was the, the basis, and we are starting to share more about this, and we'll talk about it a little bit more later in the, in the presentation. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll talk about one specific example, and, and maybe also good to go out, right? Uh, let's put this in the, in the context of the current crisis again. Uh, we've already uh, seen in a 2017 report that McKinsey, uh, McKinsey developed that, uh, that a lot of people will have to acquire new skills um, I think they were referring to 14% of the total working population or 375 million, I'm saying my heart, people would have to acquire um, new skills because otherwise uh, they would be displaced by technologies like uh, sure. automation and artificial intelligence. And the current uh, COVID-19 crisis, um, as I'm referring to it, uh, is uh, basically accelerating this change. It is. I've already talked about uh, retail experiences uh, well, changing from one day to another, right? The, the shopping mall next to my door closed from one day to, to another. And, um, and, and, and I believe according to the same McKinsey study that they published back in May 2020, 13% of the European population, so that's quite a big that's number, 13% yeah. of the European population are 
turning to their to the websites of their retailers to so to e-tailing experiences for the first time in their life. So that's gonna change consumer behavior massively, I believe. It does. It does. It's an accelerator. So um, I think we gotta pick up some pace here, right? Yeah. Because we also want to talk about uh, how to develop a skilling plan and what are the steps that you gotta take to develop your skilling plan your own. But I think it's also important to point out the fact that a lot of companies these days do not even have a training department yet. Um, Patrick in his opening uh, conversation was referring to the CLO. I kind of wonder whether everyone understands what a CLO really Chief is. Chief Learning right? Officer. There you go, there exactly, you go. a Chief Learning Officer. If you don't have a Chief Learning Officer yet, or you haven't formali formally formalized a training department yet, then I think this is a great time to uh, think about, hey, who am I gonna, <laughs> who am I gonna assign this very important task to? Maybe this is something that you wanna take on the site, or maybe this is someone you wanna recruit or hire, because, uh, like I said, it really takes a lot of investment in skills in order to basically prepare yourself for that uh, cloud era. Um, and and. I think it's also important to point out there that uh, it's very important to uh, uh, that that employees receive um, what is it training on a regular they do. basis. Uh, they do. We at Microsoft are, uh, are obliged to take uh, to, to take a lot of uh, trainings, both uh, what is it technical training, but also training more from a soft skills perspective. They also talk about what is it compliances and yeah. what type of regulations might hold for our software industry. Training is a core part of your culture and uh, if you want to transform digitally you have to make sure that training and readiness is part of your cultural uh, training and that's that's sort of core to what we do yeah. at Microsoft as well. Yeah. So let's talk a bit about one one more example and, and I just want to call this example out and, and I, we could have picked many customers but this is a customer Maersk. I think you have all uh, known or heard about them, they move uh, about 20% of the cargo worldwide uh, on a fleet of 700 ships uh, and it's a massive amount of containers. Now clearly Maersk uh, is you know, also a company that is looking at transformation. Uh, this is a company, just an example of a company that decided we don't need to run uh, our data centers anymore. Uh, they had five big data centers and they converted them onto Azure. Their goal was to do that in a year, they finished the job within six months. Uh, but besides just moving your infrastructure onto Azure, the value for Maersk was also to accelerate their innovation. You know, get out of the business of maintaining your own hardware, get out of the business of securing, uh, taking responsibility for everything from networking onto the uh, physical infrastructure, uh, and making sure that they have more resources and time available to develop and, and innovate. Uh, and some of the innovations that Maersk built were uh, is obviously associated with all their logistics and supply chain. Uh, they built an application here for you just for just give a sense an IoT based application um, that uses sensors in these containers. Uh, they ship around 400,000 refrigerated containers around the world. So you can you envision your perishable goods that need to be in a certain state, right? So they developed an app for their customers to be able to see and and and, and make changes on humidity, temperature, lighting inside the, these containers, and offer that as a service up to these customers. Again, a differentiated value because if you're in the business of shipping containers, you will go to whoever ships that at the cheapest price, right? Yeah. But you do want to differentiate your business. Again, it's about differentiation, using your data, and how do you do that optimally? So Maersk, besides getting out of the business of running your own data center, they invest heavily in skills. Uh, this was a, an, a, this a customer is being uh, managed by the Denmark team, the Danish team, and they did a good job of making sure that uh, you know they listened to the customer's requirements on what does it take to you know upskill the entire IT department. Uh, and develop more agile services on a very quick note. So they invested in DevOps, they invested in Kubernetes platforms, uh, and through hackathons and training, but a formal training plan that really helped them to get to make this move. So this is just one of, out of many examples, but I do like this 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 customer a lot. I like uh, the leadership here, yeah, right? They, they, really they took a lot of leadership. This, yeah. yeah, yeah. And you can le read the quote, you know, the, where they said, you know, "Where does the cloud stop, and where does our work begin?" And I think it's a fundamental question. And I think the, the, the answer is it depends, right? How much do you want to source from the cloud? How much responsibility do you want to take on as an IT department? 
If you decide to use Azure or any other cloud platform as a hosting platform, then you will take the responsibility of developing your own apps, securing your own apps, et cetera. If you go one step beyond that, then clearly you shifting the responsibility of the accountability that you take, but also the skilling that's required from your own IT department to make the next step. It seems like they have made the conscious choice not to, well, to leave a lot of the basic infrastructure layer stuff to us, to, uh, to us as a company, right? And, uh, and to develop, um, uh, what is it, added value added capabilities on top of the logistic services that they already they provide. They are, and uh, now they're seeing many more opportunities to go. So they are on this on their own transformation in a sense, right? So, yeah. Really nice. Good example. Yeah, this is, I mean, if you would project a little bit about Microsoft, right? And, and Microsoft itself, I talked about our own transformation that's being core. Uh, and we had to transform ourselves in four major ways, right? First, obviously, we had to develop a product that you can deliver as a service, and you know, Windows as a service, Azure as a service. But we also had to change our business models. They, you know, the, developing a new business model to be able to uh, price by user, to be able to have meters that are really measuring the consumption at a very detailed level that requires the development of a billing engine. But how do you do that uh, with a very large channel that you want to enable to co-sell and cross-sell your cloud solution. So we had to innovate our business model in a very big way. The third pillar is, is how we work is our, ourselves as Microsoft. And you can remember potentially the old days where we were releasing big releases every, every year or so. Uh, and now we are having daily releases on, on, on software and adding a lot of features because we have to keep up with the pace. So how we work, our DevOps, our agility had to change as well. And the fourth pillar is really how we use the technology ourselves within Microsoft. You know, digital transformation is obviously core as a service to what we deliver, but it's also core to how we do our own marketing. You know, digital transformation in selling, digital transformation in servicing our customers. So it helped us to propel and to become a lot more efficient in how we apply technology ourselves. And just that you know, we're using AI uh, technologies all over the company. Uh, I know that Amy is using AI technologies you know, for forecasting and prediction to take a lot of you know, manual uh, work out of the equation. So there are many examples of how you can apply the transformation ourselves as well. Do you want to talk about the learning, uh, the culture side yeah, of the Yeah, I mean, the or? culture, I think Evelyn will come up next and she will talk a lot more about the culture, but you know, in, in, in a nutshell, right, you do have to make sure you stay customer obsessed, you stay focused on what you want to achieve. Uh, and the, the key here is to act as you know, one company, break the silos and enable that growth mindset. And growth mindset is all about acquiring the right skills. So now that's, that's, really, uh, that's really the core of what we want to achieve. Uh, there you go. So I think, um, uh, of course, what we haven't touched upon yet is, hey, how do we go about and build that uh, skilling plan, right? Uh, and that's, uh, I think, uh, the most important part of the equation. Now, I've seen all the nice examples of customers uh, investing in tech intensity. Now, how do I build my skilling plan? Who can I turn to? Um, what do I need to do? I think it's also good to point out there, right, that uh, it's not just uh, Microsoft that is uh, available to help you uh, on that skilling journey, but uh, also you can turn to uh, our beloved Microsoft Learning Partners, of course. Train. In, the, in, yeah, in this specific case, uh, the LLPA or CompuTrain, uh, they've got some really capable, uh, really, uh, uh, they've got a lot of experts uh, sitting in-house delivering a lot of uh, different types of uh, training, instructor-led training. Of course, they used to run trainings in uh, physical classrooms. They do most of their work virtually now, but they also offer a lot of uh, digital learning uh, platforms, the ones that uh, Patrick just talked about. I think here also important to mention that uh, we're turning from uh, the old roles to the new roles that are, uh, that are uh, to the new capabilities that are required in the cloud era. And I just mentioned the example of, uh, what is it, a data center engineer who, has probably, who probably needs to acquire new skills in order to become a cloud architect, for example, right? Yeah. And uh, there you go. N now we need to develop a plan together with Microsoft or Computain and talk about, hey, what are the competencies that I need to acquire in order to prepare myself uh, in the right way? 
Yeah. Uh, I have to talk about, uh, I have to know about uh, cloud governance, for example. I have to know how to configure and deploy apps on the uh, Microsoft Azure platform. Suddenly I have to talk about uh, privacy, cloud privacy, and regulations that might hold for my industry. So I think there's a lot of stuff to consider here, and there's also a lot of, um, what is it, learning resources that can help you along the way. Yeah. Books. Books. We, still books. Got books, we still got books. <laughs> <laughs> Micro learning environments, online courses that we've talked about, and of course, uh, instructor led training. I think Stephanie will talk about uh, you, uh, talk to you in more detail about how to build such a learning plan. And of course, uh, the folks from the LLPA and CompreTrain will also they talk will. about building skipping plans in more detail later yeah. on in the. Uh, so I think yeah, this is a good today. time to hand it back to Patrick. And you, uh, you know, I think the examples that we've given, hopefully there were some inspiring examples and we'll make sure that we will have uh, the video and the, uh, matching the audio on the, on the video with, um, with Volvo. Uh, but you know, thanks for your, for your time and for your attention this morning. Uh, really appreciated the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, and uh, you know, we really wish you kind of a very nice and ins insightful day today. Uh, so I want to hand it back to Patrick, um, closing remarks uh, before we up, come up with the next speaker. So thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you once again, uh, guys. I think it was a great overview, and I think it's, it's lots of things to get back to during the other, other presentations. And I think you addressed uh, pretty well that, that the, the creation of the skills plans and, and the culture that is, uh, that is needed in a company to, to really uh, embrace uh, the, uh, the tech intensity. Um, next speaker of today is, is, is a very uh, 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 nice follow-up on this presentation because Evelyn Vredeveld, she is going to talk about uh, culture. She's going to talk about what needs to be done in the organization to make sure that there is a, a learning uh, uh, experience, that, that people really want to learn. Um, so we need a few minutes to, to, to shovel the setup here. Um, I think we, we will be back in two or three minutes uh, and then I'll introduce Eveline to you and uh, uh, I think this is a presentation you don't want to miss so uh, see you back in a few minutes.